This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Thank you very much, Ainsley, and thanks everybody for joining us. Looking forward to hearing your questions soon. And online with me are my two teammates, Dedi Adhuri and Ali Yansia Abdurahim, whose photos I will show you in a moment. Um, I'm at the University of Queensland and speaking from Brisbane, Australia, midday. And uh, Dedi and Ali are in Indonesia. Ali's in Makassar and um, Dedi's somewhere outside Jakarta at the moment. So I'll show you our team member first. Um, Dedi is on the left there, Ali on the far right, me in the middle. And we worked with three local people given our topic. Andy Penrang is an officer of the district government and Andy Rismayani and Andy Isma Inna, called Maya and Isma to us, are um, two local women living on the island. So today I want to address, a, so yep, local government and community. I want to talk to you about a problem which I've come across in my years of studies in co-management in a commons context. And that is whether or not the parties are actually working together in formal co-management or just needing to engage and cooperate together over the management of some commons, um, in our case, fisheries. You can get um, problems in the community government cooperation which affect them from outside the matters they can control. So in my outline today, I'll talk about the issue of vertical and horizontal linkages. We'll then talk about some highlights on the island of Salaya, um, coming from a participatory diagnosis process we've run just last year. And these are about aligning the policies, the knowledge, understanding conflicts, and the role of community champions in social influence. So looking at this visually, Think of any country, the nation, probably a provincial or state type of government, district or local government, and trying to interact in the management of a commons with a whole lot of different communities. And each of those communities, of course, have groups, households, individuals. So you have challenges shown in red um, and also some of the purple in vertical linkages. A common one we found in our Ho studies in Vietnam are that the different levels of government policy may conflict with each other, not just between government and community. You can then get community resistance to aspects of government policy. And you can also get lack of agreement within communities, particular households or groups or individuals within communities may not agree vertically with what their community governance is, is trying to establish. At the same time, you very often have challenging horizontal relations uh, within and between communities. But we also see it at any level of government between different government departments, particularly if the system is a particularly siloed type of system where one division doesn't have a lot of contact with another and yet complex problems may need several divisions to be talking together. So the big issue for us is how can government and community combine their influences better? Big question. Okay. A bit of background for how we found the information which I'm going to talk through with you today. Um, our project was funded by the World Bank and Global Environment Fund. Uh, it was called the Capturing Coral Reef Ecosystem and Related Ecosystem Services Project. Our social science study was one of many, many across different sciences, business, systems analysis and the like. We were required to um, develop a tool as the funding condition and um, we did so. This is what it looked like in the end. What I just need to tell you about today is that in working with two particular case studies on the island of Salaya, but linking in lots of other communities in the process of that, and working with the district government equally, we did a process of participatory diagnosis, which is a 
form of rapid rural appraisal involving lots of meetings. Um, we did participant observation. This has not been done before with um, participatory diagnosis at any rate, so that we could get a richer picture than you get um, in the meetings where people are constrained in what they can say, either by time or not wanting to say it in front of others. Um, and in participant observation, you can see by being part of the community for weeks. And Ali and the two local women did that part of the study. We were also fortunate to have time for a few actual activities from which we could all learn. So this is the process we were working under, actually running a process in order to develop this tool, turned it into a tool. And today I'll talk about multi-level policy analysis, about the knowledge issues, both identifying traditional knowledge and management practice and combining local knowledge with science and about conflict analysis. Sorry, I should have put a ring around the social influence because I am including that too. So our location, the first animation, Ireland are called Salaya. I still have trouble rolling my R's properly for that. It's part of South Sulawesi province in Indonesia, and it's about half an hour's flight from the capital Makassar, just, just south of the main island of Sulawesi, which sadly has been much in the news the last fortnight because of the earthquake in the north. This island, Salaya, is very long and narrow, about 80 kilometres or 50 miles long and not very wide, but it's mountainous. There's a very steep mountain range in the middle. And we worked with the two circled communities, one in the north, I see we are still named it here, but um, henceforth I'll call it the northern village, and one about the middle, um, just north of the capital. So these are Bungaya and Parak. And the other yellow stars, there are other communities we also worked with, particularly in the course of the work with community champions. So Bungaya has a population of over 1,800 and a bit over 515 households, and Parak about 2,500 people and getting close to 700 households. Villages in Indonesia actually have formal governance. They have all their customary governance, but they have status as a, a tiny government themselves, which does interact with district governance. Tiny bit about our process before I go to the content. We had meetings, community meetings, smaller group meetings within the communities and with other communities we needed to see in the course of um, further exploration under the participant observation or the champion interviews and the activities. And here's a few photos of us at work. The first two photos are meetings in Parak village. The second one is where we're having a meeting with um, district government, NGO and a prominent citizen, people who have a whole of Ireland picture rather than particular um, village affiliations. And on the right, we have a picture of our participant observation uh, going off to visit a seasonal sub-village where fishers who cannot fish during the monsoon season go across, make a temporary village on the other side of the island because fishing is their only source of food. Even if they can't make money that season, at least they can eat. So I'm going to address a number of opportunities to strengthen community government relationships, which we identified through this participatory diagnosis process. So I'm going to talk about policy, knowledge, conflict and intervention, because often the governments have to try and mediate or give rulings in conflicts between communities and social influence. I'll talk about these more as we go and in the conclusions. So first of all, aligning community and government policy. Our case communities were both very strong in customary knowledge and applying it and using their formal governance role that they have under the Indonesian system to write down and enforce internally um, their customary knowledge. And this was very interesting because there are three cultures live on the island and they're now so intermixed now, they don't have separate spaces 
apart from the boogie who are a, a seafaring people, sea nomads, no, not the boogie, that's the other one, sorry, muddled. Um, they all live together in all the villages. And in fact, one of those cultures may be the one whose person is elected head of village for a while. But together they agree, they have very, very similar customary knowledge and they agree to apply it together. Um, the middle photo on the top is Bumaya has records of its customary knowledge and official recognition of that, which must be hundreds of years old because that one is written in ancient Makassan and Ali found other ones written in Dutch, which means they must have been at the latest around World War II. On the right, we have our, where we elicited Bungaya's rules in a workshop. I couldn't do this because my Indonesian is um, virtually non-existent for this work. Um, the team conducted a policy analysis on all three levels of government, national, provincial and district. And at this stage, um, Indonesia was just changing its marine governance for the responsibility to shift from district to provincial. So that was confusing a few things and removing the close interface that had been between district and community, taking it, it back a step. And the team looked at how these aligned with the policies and customary knowledge of our two case communities and also looked at new philosophies such as um, rights-based resource, resource management and pointed out opportunities both to our case communities and to the district government. And the case communities then proceeded to amend their own laws and make them formal they realized the need for their marine spaces to be properly recorded in terms of um, GPS positioning, the outer boundaries and also their own marine protected areas they created under a previous aid program. So they did that as well. And the team helped the two communities to draft their own new village laws on coastal management. District government was really pleased with this thought it was a marvellous idea and is now working um, with the team to try to have the same thing undertaken throughout Salaya so that all communities, while each makes its own law, are making consistent regulations that all align better with what the three levels of government are trying to do. And that we hope would really strengthen everybody's ability to do what they all want to do, which is sustainable fisheries. So this mid was already making it much easier for the local government to support the community efforts in sustainable fishing. And over time, as the responsibility shifts to the province, we hope that will continue to be the case. Second one is in the area of knowledge. And we had two activities in that. My photo, our photo, I can't even remember which team member took it, is in the Bungaya area. And that's called a cerro in um, local language. It's a stationary fish trap, very elaborate. Your fish swim along, meet that neck between poles that you see in the foreground and they swim out to sea and get trapped in an arrow, go through a narrow opening, find themselves trapped in a smaller arrow and possibly even a third arrow where the fishers can just go out in small dugout canoes about three or two, two times a day and scoop the fish up really easily. So in many workshops with the community and followed up in the participant observation by Ali and the two local women, we found out and discussed the community management areas. Look at the butcher's paper there. Um, the communities explained their own community declared marine protected areas, which they'd done under the encouragement of a, a previous project, which Pakandi had been in, involved in. So that was good continuity. They explained and we recorded their customary rules on fishing practices. One of the villages had 11 different types of fishing gear they used and rules and spaces for each of them. The other had nine, similarly, rules and spaces for each of them. We learned about their customary ways of dealing 
with um, destructive fishing because this whole region had had a very bad number of years. It's a bit unclear, but you know, maybe 20 years of fishing by dynamiting coral reefs and um, putting cyanide in the water to stun uh, fish. Um, starting at a time when people really didn't know better and then over time people were trapped in some pretty negative supply chains, trapped by indebtedness. Most of the villages have worked very, very hard to try and stamp out those practices, but it hasn't completely gone yet. And we learned about the Contemporary Village Management Committee. Um, so in both of these and many, many other villages, under their current governance, they have a village government committee formally declared, which um, can help to enforce whatever rules they make. So we learned a lot about um, community knowledge and management practices, which of course the community already knows well, but was sharing. And interestingly and importantly, these vary a lot from place to place. Some communities are strong in these, others have lost it or believe they have lost it or don't apply it. And therefore, as I'll come to later, that can make for conflicts between the groups. Another thing we did, and, and this was just a wonderful opportunity that emerged during the work in progress. As part of the larger Seacrest project, there are a lot of uh, marine studies, including a team developing modeling about ocean currents, fish movements, and particularly how big and a marine protected area should be to be effective and where it should be located to be most effective because the ocean current will carry um, coral spawn from one reef to another. So this is very useful to know. Healthy reefs around one island will populate another. Healthy reefs will populate each other going down a coast in the direction of that current. And Niels Crook, shown here as a postdoctoral fellow, was very keen. He'd been working on modelling for the whole of Indonesia, but he was very keen to work directly with the community and also to scale down his tools to work at a very fine scale. And the communities were very keen to work with him. Only one of, there was only time for one of them to do it. So we did that with Bungaya, the, um, the northern community, because as part of their trying to get more credibility with district government and more recognition for their own practices, they uh, felt that if they were lucky enough that Neil's modelling agreed with their own judgment, this would really strengthen their hand. And they were genuinely interested to know whether the marine protected areas that had been established under a previous project called CORMAP, by the way, Coral Reef, I forget what the rest of the acronym stands for, but that's in our full reports. So I'll give you the reference to later. And so uh, we were able to fund Niels to come to the island. He did a lot of preparation first. And we began with meetings in which they mutually agreed goals. So um, the community or those present at the community meeting uh, made decisions about what they wanted to find out within the limits of, of Neil's technical capabilities. So they designated areas to model, lots of little grid signs on the maps. Um, they chose which fish species they wanted to model and a number of other things. And over the course of about 10 days, Niels did a lot of modeling back in the hotel and a lot more meetings with the community. And the community put a dive team together, instructed by Niels, and they ground truthed, except it was underwater truthed, the condition of the reefs, just to cross check the models there. And so they were working towards mutual goal of thinking well of the existing marine protected areas and the newly proposed ones, a good design or the best design they could be, or is something better possible from a fisheries perspective and um, combining, combining their knowledge in a, a very equitable process there. And so they did a number of things going from that butcher's paper process in community meetings, I don't have photos of the dive process, but um, 
there's part of the team um, is is uh, Maya and Isma walking with Niels and um, Ali on a beach one day near part of the ground truthing, the underwater truthing. Um, Niels produced um, models from the different locations that they looked at. And so doing all that and around the areas the people were interested in and the fish species they were interested in, he was able to model the best, technically best locations and sizes and to project how long it would take for the different fish species to recover well, if, if very well enforced marine protected areas were there. Sorry, I'm leaping on a little bit fast there. Um, at the end of the day, the community actually had some different goals. Yes, they wanted their marine protected areas to work, but one of them that wasn't technically very good was actually a, a good sort of border space in the conflict with the neighboring village and they had chosen ones that were <laughs> to have surveillance um, because they were all near occupied parts of the coast where they could keep a good watch on them from land. So the third um, story or issue I want to share with you is that of conflict. So during the time there and particularly um, during Ali, Maya and Isma's presence in the village on um, participant observation, a very fierce conflict erupted between the northern village, which is a very strong and very keen on customary law for sustainable fisheries, and the next door village, whose fishers were coming in with spear guns and bright lights, um, killing very large fish in very large numbers while they were resting at night and damaging the reef wherever the guns hit as well. And the fishers from the neighbouring village um, had really no concept that anybody had a reason for getting upset by this. No idea of ecological damage in fishing in that way. And the, the eruptions were fierce. We won't go into that now, but um, if you read our reports, it's an interesting story. First, the sub-district government and later the district mayor, in effect, the Bupati, tried to intervene. The sub-district one intervened favouring the sustainable fishing. The others were aggrieved, as typically happens in win-lose solutions, went off to the very newly elected Bupati, who had a business background but no ecological background, um, who reversed the decision and had to make it apply to the whole island because he couldn't just make a decision for two villages, which set all of sustainable fishing back on the island a very long way because it was now suddenly illegal for, legal for anybody to fish with spear guns and bright lights at night. So the district staff tearing their hair out at this stage, even though they'd been part of giving advice, said, well, you know, can you help us from what you know? And we said, well, yes, we're very happy to put a conflict analysis into our toolkit and run it. So we adapted one that's developed originally by the um, mental block. Um, it's a, a, conflict, a conflict network. Um, the Australian psychologists, it's Australian psychologist conflict network. And we, as we did our work and analyzed this conflict, we and the analysis works. You have to have a clear issue in the middle, in this case, conflict over fishing gear and grounds. And you list all the different parties to that conflict, any party which is affected by or affects that issue. So we've got a number of villages, the two conflicting villages, or at least the fishers from the second village, neighbouring villages, which were also watching closely because it had implications for them, and various levels of government and other parties. I'm not going to talk you through all of this in detail. I'll just illustrate briefly. But for each, we looked at their context, because even though they're on the same island, it's different in practical terms. The strengths, the needs of that party, 
and their concerns. What were they afraid of going wrong? And to illustrate quickly, for the northern village, um, our case village, they had east and west coastlines, so they could fish in both seasons. There are two monsoons there which close one coast off. The other village did not have that. Um, they had strong and old customary knowledge and management, strong village management, various other factors. Similarly, different needs, different strengths, different concerns. The village, the fishers, I wouldn't say, we wouldn't say the whole village was in conflict with um, the first village, just the fishers who were fishing with spear guns. They had a short coastline, west coast only, so of course they're tempted to go around to the east coast, some other villages, waters, and, and fish at other times. They claimed they had no knowledge of traditional fishing technologies. Actually, Dedi and Ali made inquiries in the participant observations. That village had had, it just hadn't been passed down to the other generations, etc. And both villages had different opportunities and concerns. And one of the big opportunities was that they had interrelated families and they did not want to be in conflict. So there was hope to solve the problem. Moving on with the different uh, vertical alignments. We did a lot of work. This was Ali's sub-project um, about champions. We found there were champions both in some of the villages who very voluntarily just wanted to solve destructed fishing and came up with fascinating philosophies for doing so and strategies of social influence for doing so. Ali then found many people working at whole of Ireland level, either working for district government or in NGOs, um, or privately, and similarly, way beyond anything their jobs demanded, they were passionate about solving destructive fishing and had particular strategies for doing so. And by exploring these, we could inspire other people to say, look, anybody can actually get up and take action. Nobody has to authorise you. And with their great willingness, they shared um, what their strategies were, how they applied them to make lessons for others. And we could also see these people, some within a community and working laterally with other communities, some connecting between the government people and, and the village people, where we were making excellent horizontal and vertical alignments outside the formal structures for solving destructive fishing. So my conclusions um, from today's presentation, collectively concluded with Daddy and Ali and the team. In terms of vertical alignments, there is high risk in policy differences. Um, so if one can align them by mutual agreement, it helps everybody to work together better. Um, and the problems we had with that big conflict because the regulations were out of step with each other at the time. Respect for different forms of knowledge is probably both horizontal and vertical as an issue. And conflicts, governments get called into conflicts. So that's a vertical issue for them. In terms, sorry about my timer, dismiss. In terms of horizontal alignments, there are big differences between communities in terms of their customary knowledge and their political will to apply the customary knowledge in a contemporary situation and differences between their management strategies. So that means you've got communities up and down a coast operating on different rules among themselves and potentially coming into conflict. There's potential for conflict, but there's also potential for collaboration and cooperation. Some of the neighboring villages which were watching this big conflict promptly got together and made an alliance between three or four of them, came to our team for help, which the local members are continuing to offer, because they wanted to solve this problem from what they'd observed and prevent destructive fishing coming into their area and you know, spoiling the good work they'd been doing, protecting their own fishing grounds over on the East Coast. There's opportunities in, we believe, participatory processes that lead to dialogue vertically between communities and district government and lead to joint problem solving in the absence of co-management or within 
co-management, which does exist in many places. We also saw many, many opportunities and occurrence in mutual learning. So thank you very, very much. There's our picture again, our emails and some um, web links to our reports. Um, I believe that you're going to have access to this later and I'll leave that switched on while we go through questions. Thank you, Ainsley. All right, thanks, Helen, that was great. So is any of, any of the uh, viewers right now, if you have any questions, please go to the Q&A little box and type them in and I'll read them out and we can ask Helen. Uh, no pressure, but we love questions. Yeah. And, and invite Daddy and Dali to comment as well. Yes, in exactly. The, so. Particularly in the, the question phase. Oh, it looks like we have one. Let me read it. Uh, so how did you get the good facilitator in facilitating the process of dialogue? Facilitator. Sorry, could you repeat that again? How do we get the facilitator process? We... I didn't give our disciplines, actually. I'm an environmental psychologist. Deddy's a marine anthropologist and Ali's a um, sociologist. We are all skilled facilitators in our own right. And we did a lot of design together and, and joint facilitation, ev even across the language barrier, because most of it had to be done in Bahasa, Indonesia. Um, Andy Penrang is a fantastic facilitator as well, although because he worked for district government, most of the time he'd talk with us, sit back during community meetings, and then maybe just add a little bit at the end. And um, Andy and Isma, uh, sorry, Maya, Maya and Isma were also rapidly um, learning skills in this regard as well. And, and part of their wonderful growth during the project was seeing them stepping up more and more to join in the facilitation. So we are, we are skilled facilitators. We didn't need an external facilitator. Though, of course, we regularly took local advice on the best way to handle and design things. And the three local members of the team were always part of discussions about, okay, what's the next set of meetings and events we need? How should we organise that? Who's going to do what? Perfect. All right, we have another question. It says, Indigenous knowledge is often suppressed by prioritizing scientific knowledge. How did you get the government bureaucrats to accept the importance of Indigenous knowledge? Oh, um, yeah. I don't know if Deddy would like to try to, to answer that. I could, but I'd, I'd love to throw that to Deddy if you're in a suitable place or Ali. Okay. I can take that uh, question, I think. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, in fact, in Indonesian uh, legal uh, transformations now, traditional knowledge is already acknowledged in some uh, rules and regulations. And uh, there are also some, of course, NGOs movement uh, which try to uh, uh, empower or revitalize together with the community their tradition. So that's kind of uh, some uh, uh, mutual effort of acknowledging uh, the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the use of traditional uh, or knowledge in uh, coastal management. So that's kind of combination that's uh, taking place in Indonesia and particularly in also in our uh, field side. That's my response. Thank you. Okay, mute, yourself, mute yourself, Daddy. You're in a, thanks, he's in a noisy place. I'll, I'll just, summarize that like because Daddy's clearly in a noisy place at the moment um sorry Daddy, can you just mute because of the sound mute thank you sorry um, i'm in the airport i know you're, you're, i know you're in a noisy place so so as uh, Daddy was explaining which is great because i've forgotten um Recognition of customary knowledge is now part of Indonesian law, and that's being you know, rolled out and, and recognised and being made practical. And, and there are also big networks. I know a lot of NGOs are active in this, and Deddy himself is, which are really trying to um, promote this and to promote rights-based fisheries. So those two factors are working strongly. 
and on this particular island because of the previous activities of CORMAP and the particular champions and individuals working there, there is strong respect for the traditional knowledge in principle and a desire to have it work and contribute to more sustainable fisheries. It's just that it is patchy between different communities. And they are learning from each other though. Sorry, next question. Very cool. Okay, so we have to whom did okay, to whom did people tend to be indebted since you mentioned people experiencing debt, I believe as a factor motivating more destructive slash unsustainable fishing practices. Uh, we've got to be a little bit careful what, what we um, say here. Basically, well, it's, it's actually documented in our champions report. Um, basically, what, what had been happening is overseas supply chains were coming in. I think it was 1980s or 1990s. Um, stationing personnel in, on the island. Um, Encouraging fishers to sell to the encouraging fishers to um, bomb the coral reefs, buying their fish from them, then generously lending them huge amounts of money in local terms, getting them used to the high life, getting their wives used to the high life, and then suddenly turning around and saying, Those weren't gifts, those were loans. Now you've got to pay back this big debt you've made from all that money I lent you, and I need the money by next week here's the bomb. The only way they could catch enough fish um, to repay their debt was to bomb again. So they would be caught in a poverty trap of obligation to the big men. The big men, the original big men went back to the country that they came from, but by this time they'd established a local infrastructure which is carrying on that supply chain. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ali, without going beyond what's appropriate to say within our ethics applications and um, safety of local people? Have I, have I summarized the process reasonably there? Sorry to interrupt. I think that's, that's, uh, that's very much it. Well, eh? a good explanation on the situation there. No, it's, thanks, Teddy. So it's an illegal supply chain which has proved very, very difficult to stamp out. And, and there are local political reasons in some of the villages for that being difficult to stamp out but the local NGO is also using some pretty clever strategies to try and wean fishermen off that supply chain and onto a legal supply chain. Very interesting. Okay, we have like five minutes left and two more questions. So the next one is, how to drafting the village regulation? Legal drafting, I think it's not easy. Is there any capacity building to the villagers to make they can create their own village regulation. So I guess it's asking, do villagers have the capacity or the means to create own, their own regulations within their village? Oh, Daddy, Daddy, uh, probably Daddy best to answer that one, but Ali is, is equally knowledgeable there. Yes, uh, actually, uh, so we try to uh, help them to drop the uh, uh, village regulations because we have some experiences in other uh, places. Uh, so this is for us. It's not first uh, experience of uh, assisting community uh, uh, doing the similar thing. But they also consulted with the uh, district uh, legal, uh, you know, institutions. So they get some support from uh, various uh, sources, but uh, the, the, the village regulations is actually just formulations, their traditions. Uh, so it's, it's not, uh, it's not uh, that difficult for them, expect that, of course, they are uh, coming from the oral tradition uh, also communities. With some external assistance, they can do that. 
So in SS we uh, help them uh, to do that. There's some uh, support from uh, us, but also with the consultations of local uh, government, with the local government. Is that and they clear? Routinely, yeah, very much thanks. And they routinely make regulations on other matters, land-based matters. They, they have that power within the Indonesian system. Thanks, Ainsley. Awesome, okay. Commercial incentives externalizing environmental costs lead to destructive fishing practices. Did the fishers connect commercial fishing practices experiences as a loss of income and how was this mitigated? Oh, um, you might need to repeat that. I'm just trying to get a, a grasp on the, on the question there. Sure. There is actually very little commercial fishing on that island. This is mostly artisanal fishing it, unlike, say, um, Brazil, where I've had some exposure and you have large-scale commercial fishing encouraged by governments and competing for fish with the artisanal fishers, that wasn't really an issue there. The government was trying to commercialise the fishers, the fishing more to get these fishers going further offshore to go for the pelagic deep-sea fish and take pressure off the inshore, but that wasn't working for a, it was only working for some people for a few reasons. So sorry, could you repeat the question Ainsley in terms of the commercial so, fishing? So I guess they were just looking to hear about how was there, did they experience, did villagers experience a lot of loss of income from just the fishing practices suggested to be more sustainable and how was the income loss mitigated if there was? And Helen, this is Charlie. Uh, I put the question in chat. Okay. That helps. Okay, but then I've got to work out how to open chat. So, um, <laughs> uh, it's at the bottom. I'd rather not. Um, and and Daddy or Ali, feel free to help me on this. Um, really, that illegal supply chain for the destructive fishing was probably the only commercial fishing I saw. There were efforts on the island to get legal supply chains more for the offshore fisheries. Um, where the fishers were really experiencing, but there wasn't much yet, where the fishers were really experiencing loss of income was just through sheer environmental deterioration, just loss of fish. Um, Ali or Deddy, can you um, improve that answer? Yes, uh, actually, uh, the, the, the management that we are discussing and uh, at the end, it's uh, form in the it's formulated in the form of village governance, uh, village uh, regulation. It's actually a way of protecting uh, their uh, own uh, coastal uh, waters from the enrollment of external fishers who are mostly associated with the destructive fishing. So this is. When people talk about uh, destructive fishing, which is part of the uh, large scale international connected live free fish uh, uh, business, actually, uh, is usually associated with outsiders or external fishers or non village uh, uh, fishing activities. So the, the, the uh, coastal village. Uh, Regulation is a way of protecting uh, their coastal waters from these uh, destructive uh, fishing practices. That is even so with the actually the uh, establishment of marine protected area for them. The main purpose of uh, uh, establishing MPA is to uh, get the regulation. Uh, uh, strengthened uh, in order to exclude other non village uh, uh, fishers fishing in their territory. I hope that explained the, the, the uh, answer to the question. Well, I'm going to have to wrap the series up because we've got to get to our next uh, speaker. So, on behalf of IA IACSC and all the World Commons Week organizers, I'd like to thank all the attendees and Helen, Didi, and Ali for preparing and giving their very interesting webinar. 
on behalf of on behalf of IASC and the World Commons Week organization team, we thank you for attending and speaking. Thank you very much too, Ainsley. Yes. Thank you All very right. much, Ainsley. Have a good day, a good night, wherever you're tuning in from. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>